Okay. Uh, can I have your attention, please? I am, uh, well, I wasn't, I didn't hurry that much because I figured out that you were a little bit weird out. Uh, so our break turned out to be 15 minutes rather than 10. Don't think that I'm not aware, but I did that on purpose. Second thing is, uh, last time I noticed that you listened to me much better when I was not moving around. Is it true that some of you are losing concentration because I'm walking a lot? Anybody who is sort of not very comfortable when I move around? Don't you feel uh, no? Uh, well, anyway, OK. That's, that's, OK. I, I'm, I'm sort of trying to make sure that you don't want me to sit down. OK. OK. Now we have another group coming in. Now, uh, let me make a test. How many of you read the comments for quiz one? Comments for quiz one. How many of you read that? Comments on quiz one that I wrote and placed it at the web. OK. Now, this is, a very good, this is a very good percentage if you are sincere. We are doing a good job. Now, those of you who have not seen it, who are not aware, should make a note of that. OK. Question? Do you have any questions to ask me? Fox, do you have any questions to ask me? OK. So let's go over what the things that we are going to do. Now, we're going to talk about, OK. OK, let me have complete silence so that I can start without sh shouting. OK, now, we're going to talk about charts and diagrams for almost two hours, including uh, throughout the word process quite for quite a long time. And now, what we are going to do is we are going to learn some technique that will do this in a more formal way, rather than writing everything one after the other. So the charts and diagrams that we are going to see are basically going to give us some formalism on the way that we see these things. Now, let us understand what we mean by formalism. Now, first of all, we would, be, we would like to communicate whatever we do about the process with some other people. For example, in the sections, I ask you, what do you think about that, so on and so forth. And we were able to communicate. You should be able to communicate with your peers, with other colleagues that will be included in the decision making of whatever you are dealing with. So number one is if you have some determined way of doing charts and and diagrams, if those are the well-determined tools, then this is going to permit all of these work to be communicated and comprehended more readily. Okay? So that people, when they see certain signs, will immediately understand that this is what you mean. Now, of course, this is easier than verbal explanation, but you lose some details. Am I right? Because verbally explaining certain things may make certain definitions clearer, but you lose that, that distinction. However, luckily, the things that we are going to write here will be the things that, can, that we will be able to describe by those charts or by those symbols and so on. This is number one. Number two, if we can do this, in other words, if we can have a certain type of chart, there are some algorithms. What is the meaning of an algorithm? Have you heard the word algorithm? OK. Now, some of you have heard, but algorithm is basically, in a detailed way, you line up the steps on how to do certain thing. For example, multiplication. What do you do in multiplication? You have been doing multiplication for how many years now? 13 years. How do you do multiplication? Let's do it in the simplest possible way without using calculators. So what you do is you start from the last digit, whatever that digit is, 
and you multiply that, and there is a certain way of doing it. Now, can you write that as steps? Step number one, do this. Step number two, do this. Step number three, if you are finished, do it again. If you are not finished, do it again. If you are finished, now add all those numbers. And then you have to put the, uh, uh, the decimal point correctly. OK? So can I write this in a more formal way? Yes, I can, actually. This is simple, so we don't need to write it. But if it is a little bit more complicated, I need to write it up in a formal way. This is called algorithm. And it turns out that if you want to computerize anything, if you want to computer, computer operates with those algorithms. OK. So if I can make it ready in this chart or form, there are certain algorithms that I can apply immediately using that form. This is, this is what I mean in short. Now, the third one is you can see that for analysis purposes, you can divide a work into its smaller components. This is what we have already done in the airport example. Because what I did was I specified a certain process, and we all discussed the fact that that process actually was, uh, uh, can be divided into sub-processes. Like we said, baggage, baggage out. Now, baggage out means that you are going to do a number of things one after the other to, to take it out. It's not a, something that you do in a second. It's a, it's a procedure that you have to apply. Now, most of the diagramming techniques will help you in dividing the total into smaller parts, okay? which is very important because this is the way that we operate as engineers, divide and conquer. In order to understand something, we divide it into details. Now, next thing is, is very important. If we are talking about improvement, now, if we are going to improve certain things, we have to make sure that we can show that it is an improvement. Unless you have a very detailed way of writing everything, or unless you have a chart or diagram associated with it, you, it's very difficult to show an improvement. Whereas now, it will be very easy to show that improvement. OK. And finally, uh, if you completely propose a new thing to do. Not improvement, but get rid of it and give another one. OK? Completely new one. Get, let's get rid of the Constitution and have a new one like that. OK? Get rid of everything that we have. Still, these type of techniques are going to be extremely helpful in constructing new methods of doing a certain process. OK. So this is the general objectives. Now, let's start with the so-called gun chart. I'm going to give a few examples. Now, you have a reading associated with that. Second question of the day. Who read the material that was uploaded uh, to your website? OK, now, hands are fewer. Well, make it two hands, yeah, because like, you're, you're very valuable. OK, now, of course, what I'm expecting is, I'm expecting that you look at those at least to understand what we have here. So if you are going to ask a question, then it might be easier for you to formulate that. That's the purpose of giving the reading ahead of time. I had a lot of people asking me, where are the readings of these courses and so on? Well, here are, well, we have it now available. But if you are not going to read it, of course, that's something else. No problem. Now, we're still in the beginning. OK. Now, the first example that we are going to see is the so-called gun chart. Now, gun chart, what is, what is gun? Do you know what gun is? There are some people who might know it, so. OK, gun is actually the last name of a certain person. It's, the, the guy's name is Henry, Henry Gun. OK, he invented this type of visual displays. And that's the reason why they are called gun chart. Now, what this gun chart is showing is actually a schedule. Now, this is interesting. We have all projects listed here. Let's say that you are working for two courses. In each of those courses, you have a project to finish. So project A is the first project, and project B is the second project. So these, these are each course. Now, what this is doing is simply, in the time span, it is showing 
which component of which project you have to do in order to finish everything on time. So for example, let's look at project A. Project A overall should start in the 14th of the first month. Okay, this, this is all uh, US style where you have the month first and then the day comes afterwards. So this is basically the first month, day 14. So you're gonna start here and you are hoping to end it by the end of May. But this is the whole project. So what you do is you divide the project into some smaller processes. It's the same thing. So this is task one, we call it task. This is task two, task three, task four. And the interesting part is that all these tasks here can only be performed if the previous one is finished. So you have, like your courses, some prerequisite. If I change the scale, made this years, this might be the courses that you should take in order to graduate. Okay, so you have to finish all those courses. Now note that I am showing this in a very nice way on a, on a, on a graph where I have time on, on one axis and I have tasks that I have to perform in the other axis. Actually, this is a schedule. The way that you are going to perform this is if you can make a decision on that, okay? This is basically a schedule that you create. You can think about this in, in the following way. I have two planes, plane number one and plane number two, or plane A and plane B, okay? Or let's say, this is not plane, this is something else. I have a single plane that I'm flying. So what I will do is I am taking into consideration the whole day. So the axis here can correspond to 24 hours. So I am going to start and come back to the same point and I will repeat that every day. So this plane comes back and forth in between Ankara and Istanbul. So my flight is going to start here, reach Istanbul, stay in the, at the gate for some time, pick up new customers, come back to Ankara, stay in Ankara for some time, okay? But the plane is not working at that point. And then move to Istanbul again, come back to Ankara. So this is actually a schedule, okay? So you can see that you can show a lot of things with a graph like this. So what is a schedule then? Schedule at least shows me the start and finish times of different operations. Okay? Now, let's look at project B. Now, when I look at project B, it doesn't look like that it's a plane. Why? Because the plane cannot be in two different places at the same time. Okay? Well, you cannot divide the plane into two. Okay? So, probably this is corresponding to a, a project where I may start task B2 after I can finish task B1. On the other hand, at some point in time, I can start task B3 while B2 is uh, going on. Okay? Now, you can see that there is another thing that we are showing here in the gun chart, in the schedule. It not only shows the starting and finishing times, but it may show the relation between different activities. So if you have a relation which tells you that you should finish this before you start the other, then this is how it is explained is in this chart. You can see that this chart is extremely valuable. And unfortunately, up to, I think, three, five years ago, we, we didn't have any facility that would create gun charts in a sophisticated way using machines. It's, it's difficult, actually, if you come to think of it. But nowadays, with the current technology, if you, have, uh, if you can specify tasks and everything, you can automatically represent it in the computer in a nice way. Now, this is a very interesting representation because now, now if you are interested in decreasing the total time of project A, you can see your alternatives. Now, how about project B? It's not that simple. 
Now, of course, this is a very simple example with two or three tasks. What happens if I am using this specific chart to talk about the construction business that's taking place for the third airport in Istanbul? We will have probably at least 10,000 tasks in certain detail, of course. If you detail it more, it will be more. But if I am not mistaken, they have a chart which is probably around 6,000 different tasks. And all of them are very much related to each other because you cannot open the bridge before you have the construction completed. Okay? So there are a number of things which are related to each other. You can see that in this way you can show very complicated jobs or projects or a group of tasks in a very simple chart. This is called gun chart. Questions? Now, you're going to see more detail of these in different courses, as well as 271. OK? Now, another group of chart is the so-called operation chart. OK. Now, this is important for us because this is what we have been doing for some time. OK? And so what we're going to do is we're going to show we're, there will be a graphical and symbolic representation of the operations used to produce a certain product. Remember, I talked about this pen, the manufacturing of this pen. There are a number of operations involved in this. First of all, you have to have, you have to obtain the shell of this. Then you have to put the cap underneath, which is a constant cap. You cannot remove it. Then you're going to put ink in it. No, first of all, you're going to put the material, which is going to absorb the ink. And then probably you're going to put the ink in it. And then you're going to manufacture separately this part. And both of them will come together. Now, this is a simple operation. But you're going to see that it even requires a number of different type of things that we have to do. Now, operation chart basically is general name given to this type of uh, listing of operations. OK. Now, there are two types of operations in general. Operation type 1 is called processing or assembly operation. This is usually used in manufacturing, but there are service counterparts of it as well. So what you do is, for example, in a given operation, you change the shape or you do some kind of a, a mechanical processing. And so either change or properties are changed. Or you bring two items together. That's assembly. Whereas you might have some other types of operations which are called inspection. Inspection is an operation to check whether everything is working in the way that you want. It is not something that you create at the end. There is no new product, but you make sure that the product works. So it is an important type of operation. These are details, actually, but I think uh, you will understand that. Now, this is a very typical uh, chart for a subassembly. So the end product is basically you have uh, some kind of a mechanical operation where you start with a sheet metal, okay, like this, a sheet of metal, and then you apply some operations. You don't need to know what they are. You're going to learn it in another course, actually, what they are. Okay? And note that you might have, this is one part. You might have another part. You can always process them in parallel. In other words, if you are doing it on one part, of course, one part with one part, you can only have one operation at a time. But if you have two different parts, you can do it in parallel. Nothing to do with the parallel government system that we have around in these days. Okay? So you can do it in parallel. It's the same idea. I have to say that. OK. OK, so this is, is this recorded? Yeah, I, I'm in trouble. OK. So this is sort of. Again, you can see that you can do it in parallel. But at some point in time, you bring them together. 
So you can see that you bring them together at this stop. Now, what does this explain? This explains that you do a certain operation, 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 operation. In parallel, you have five operations. And here, you bring them together. So this means that in order to be able to bring them together, you have to make sure that both of them are finished. So this shows the sequence of operations that you have to perform. And at the same time, it shows the freedom that you have with respect to doing it in parallel or the times that you are going to do that. OK? This is another thing that you buy. So a motor comes unpacked. You inspect whether the motor, the engine is working. And then you have a power cord which is purchased, you unpack, inspect, and you bring it, you assemble it with the motor, and then you assemble everything together, and then you inspect, and that little thing, whatever you are manufacturing, is ready. Now, isn't this similar to what we were talking about when we were talking about the things that go on when we, are, when we, we were talking about airline operations? Or, Rice cooking or Toshkaizen. It's exactly the same idea. You have certain things that you can do in parallel, while the other one is automatically being done in a certain way. You put everything to the cooker, and then you have some spare time. You can do something else in between. OK? So basically, this is a chart that will simplify the way that I'm going to see. Now, instead of writing paragraphs, if I have this picture, it will mean more. I will be able to communicate my ideas in a, in a much clearer way. Am I right? So this is actually the use of those charts. Now, the problem here is, who is creating this chart? OK, it's not coming in a ready-made fashion. After you observe, you are the people who are creating this chart. OK? In other words, you're going to put in a certain format which is understandable by others. And this is the format. OK. Questions on this? OK. So basically, previous. OK. Now, operations chart shows each manufacturing operation required to produce the final product. We have seen that. A circle is used to specify the operation. We already used a circle. Now, basically, what we do is we start when we are introduced a certain material, and then we have operations, and at the end, we come up with the final product. So this is basically what we need to know. I already talked parts of it here. Now, what is the step-by-step -step procedure? Now, how are we going to materialize this operation chart? So it gives you some hints of doing it. OK? When you do it, this is like an algorithm. If you follow everything, do it properly, you will be able to come up with the process chart. Now, in your homework number one, I'm going to give you some examples that you can work on and make up, come up with this operations chart. In a little bit more complicated system, of course. Not manufacturing but a service system. Now, identify the parts to be manufactured and purchased. So you are going to do some manufacturing, and some items will be purchased. We are still a country who, which cannot manufacture its own engine. The motor always comes from somewhere else. Well, actually, I'm exaggerating. We have very good electrical motors that are manufactured in Turkey. Very, very high quality electric motors, which are used in a number of different uh, products, like uh, refrigerators and so on and so forth. Not, not automobile, but all the other equipment that you can imagine. And so, but note that here we have a decision to make, am I right? If we are starting this from scratch, which items should we purchase, which items should we manufacture? That's the simplest decision that you will be confronted to give, OK? But it's a decision. And you're going to see that these type of decisions can be evaluated in a certain way. In one of the courses, especially, you're going to see application of that, engineering economy. How are you going to make that decision? 
Okay, let's say that we have decided that. Determine the operations required to fabricate each part and sequence. You sequence them. It turns out that sequencing them is also a decision, might be a decision. Some of them technology does not allow you to sequence them because the machine that you buy will do it in a certain sequence and you cannot interfere with that. But if you have many operations in between, there are certain relations that you can change. You're going to see that in 271, how one can do that. And, but basically, you determine an assembly for the sequence or assembly for buyouts, fabricated parts. Everything is actually you need to have before you can come up with the process chart. Draw the operation chart as explained. Now you can put some time standards, numbers, descriptions, and other relevant information. We're going to see an example now. OK. So this is the algorithm. You see that, actually, even that simple thing requires a lot of information. But however, you have to understand that if you want to convey that information to another colleague, this is what you need to do. OK, let's go another step. OK. Now, there are a number of different types of process charts. Now, you can analyze the material flow, which we call a flow process chart, analysis of a material or workpiece being processed. The previous example was a flow process chart. You simply follow the product itself. Okay. Whereas you might have a worker process chart. In the Tosh Kaisen example, actually, you can think that you should be following the worker. Because the time savings that you are going to make is going to be with the worker. So you might have some flow process charts as well if you follow, for example, the bread. On the other hand, if you follow the guy, then it will be a worker process chart. Note that it is going to be, of course, related to each other but not necessarily the same thing. OK? Now, uh, this, this is important. Now, of course, there are a lot of intricacies of these. And hopefully, you're going to see more examples in another course. Now, this is basically a form process chart. This, this is the chart that follows the orders that you give. You have some forms to give orders to do certain things in, in, in a factory environment. So it follows how the paper flow, paperwork is flowing from one place to another. This is very important. If you know how to do it for, for example, to get Imar Izni, to get a building permission in Turkey, if you have the form process chart of building permission permit in Turkey, you become a constructor. I can tell you that with that information. That information is extremely intricate. OK? So this is another way of looking at it. You can follow the material. You can follow the people who is doing the work. Or you can follow the orders, the way that papers are flowing, so that everybody gets the information. Okay. So uh, these are different types. OK. Now, there are basically five different symbols used. Because people thought that these five symbols would more or less specify or define anything that one needs to specify in processes, especially that are related to manufacturing environments. So the, one, the first one we have already seen that it's, it's an operation. Operation changes the form or brings two things, it changed the form in summary. Brings two things together, assembly is also an operation, so on and so forth. The second one is transportation. Okay, remember the Toskaisen examples? Okay, the guy was transporting the butter from the refrigerator to wherever he was going to put it on the butter. And the bread was transported from here, there, and so on. You need to have transportation. Why? Because if you are using certain uh, equipment or certain parts, they should be stored somewhere. So if I go to this one before the others, so 
usually transportation is in between the storage and the place where the processing takes place. So you're going to move that from the storage to where the processing is going to take place. This is sort of the battery that we changed. That's the storage of the battery. We changed it. And, and this is actually, I need to transport that. So you can see that certain parts are going to be stored. They will wait for processing. And they will only pick it from the storage when you need it. But that requires a store, a transportation. Now, if the storage is nearby, you can just walk two steps and pick it up. How about if the storage is in China? OK, are you going to pick it up one by one? How are you going to pick it up? Well, in larger quantities. OK, now this is going to be one of the issues that we will try to resolve. How many at a time should I take from there to here in order to minimize certain performance measures? OK, that will be an important problem. Because basically, it is going to be related to a number of costs. OK. Now, another operation is inspection. You check whether things are really working in the way that it should work. OK? That's called inspection. So when you let Vedat Milor eat the rice, he is inspecting it. OK? <laughs> OK. So viciously, he is eating it. OK. So that's inspection. And usually, most of the operations that we have requires inspection operations in between. Even if you are doing a service, let's say that you went to a bank, you are withdrawing some money. Why do, what do you do? You check the amount of money yourself as well as even if it comes from the machine or from a bank teller. You, you count it yourself as well. Or even if you don't do it, you look at the receipt and find out uh, that's inspection. Now, finally, we have what is called a delay. Delay means that it is an implicit operation. For example, let's say that you are painting something. OK? So when you paint something, you have to make sure that it has to wait before you can start using it. OK? So you paint it. Your operation is completed. But you put a delay. And that delay is something that you specify. And that delay is 20 minutes. Now, you can say that that 20 minutes cannot be changed. No. I can use different chemicals so that the dryness is going to be obtained in 10 minutes. So that's like an operation, but you don't spend any resource for that operation. It just stays there. That's called delay. Now, in certain cases, delay is not the unexpected lateness that is created because of something. Delay is knowingly, on purpose, you let the material sit without doing anything. That's your purpose. Do, you do it on purpose. Like cooking rice. You have a delay operation at the end. My cooking style requires a delay operation at the end. I turn off all the heat and everything. It waits and simmers for 20 minutes. Otherwise, the taste is not going to be there. I think you, you do it the same way as well. OK, she was laughing very intensely, so. OK, any questions on this? Any questions on what they mean? I think this is very straightforward, am I right? I, if you can concentrate, you can understand what's going on. OK, so these are different examples. OK, you can see that standards these are the operations that we have. And there are different types of operations that we are not going to use very frequently, in this course at least. But there are large number of operations which may mean something. For example, mixing, drive nail, drill hole, and so on and so forth are more detailed operations. And if you want to give a better impression, then you increase the number of symbols. Now, usually for this course, all these five that you see over there will be sufficient. But you can see that for sophisticated needs, you need more symbols to, to differentiate between different types of operations, especially. 
Okay, so these are the standards that are known and accepted by a wide variety of engineering uh, fields. Okay? Because remember, one of the reasons that we were preparing this type of charts was to give information, to, to share information. So you have to make sure that whatever you have written here is understood by the other. So that's the reason why you need to have them in standards. Okay, question. Okay, let's move one step further. Okay. Uh, now, uh, okay, so these are, these are the descriptions. Operation occurs when an object is intentionally changed. Transportation, I think I have already done this. Now, there is also another difficulty. You might have a combined operation. This is an operation that considers inspection as well as the operation itself. So you might have some machines that are doing it automatically while they are performing another operation. So you do it, both of them at the same time. Humans are usually capable of doing that as well. When you are sort of doing something here, you can also check whether it's working or not. Okay. So these are, you can see that you can increase the complication levels. Now, process charts, this is sort of the wrap up. Process charts summarizes the whole process. They are used to compare the existing and the proposed method. So what does this mean? This means that I prepare a process chart for the current method. Then you come up with suggestions in the classroom and so on. And somebody, hard workers, sit down and prepare another process chart that will combine the suggestions. So you have now two pictures. One of them is the existing system. The other one is the proposed system. Now, how are we going to compare this? We are going to compare them by looking at some details of those processes. For example, the time that it takes. Okay? But you, are, you can prepare these two faces uh, or two different types in, in accordance with the same rules. Now, comparison would be simpler. So, basically, let me move here. For example, this is a process chart. Okay, you have a more, the last slide, if you look at this last slide, you have the top portion of this which is read readable in your case. Okay, can you read this or is it too small? But look at the last slide at the, at the back, last one. Okay, I have the first six, seven of them. Okay, now this is a very typical operations chart. Let us see what it is writing. You have the activity description and then here, you have the symbol that describes the activity. Now, the arrow is transportation, actually. Okay? You can have different types of arrows to represent that. And the third one is time. So the time it takes to do that. Now, some of them doesn't have time. Why? Let's look at, for example, the first one. Forgings transported from forge shop. So somebody is going to go there and bring it in. If the fourth shop, the storage is very nearby, you can write 10 seconds there. But that may not make sense. So you don't have any information on that. Distance is 300 meters. So it is going to take probably five minutes. Now, all the other times are in hours and days. OK? So five minutes is not very important, you can say, for this application. But sometimes it might be important. There are some, it's 10 minutes, 30 minutes, and so on. So we might need to interrogate why we don't have that information. Distance is sometimes important, sometimes it's not. And when we see the notes, we have the whole picture. Because it is carried with a forklift truck. So forklift truck brings it in front of us. 300 meters will take probably one minute to do that. That's the reason why that time is not specified. Now, in general, in most of the process charts, what you're going to have is this activity description, this symbol, 
that you have here that shows the type of activity, whether it is uh, delay, operation, or transportation, or storage. And then you're going to have notes which writes other pertinent, relevant details, like time, forklift, or it describes certain other things. For example, it says you repeat it 10 times, 5 times, so on and so forth. So there are different details, of course. You can see that if you are doing something which is extremely serious, you're going to have more details. If it is something like rice cooking, it will be less important. Depends on the time that you want to spend on that specific uh, problem. Because the time you spend is also money. So it depends. The details will be a function of what you want to come up at the end. But this is a very nice tool with respect to manage certain things in a really meaningful way. Everybody will understand this when you have this chart. Of course, in the field, other engineers, and so on. OK. Now, no, 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 I, I, I made a mistake. I will go back two pages. OK. Previous, previous. Now, this is another chart that is very useful. Because if we are modeling, for example, the passenger movement in a, uh, going to a gate, this is going to be something which is very typical. So this specific picture shows how a part moves from a certain place. Uh, let's say it starts from uh, from here, well, this is the end, okay? It starts from here. You receive the material, then you put it in the storage, then you move it for a certain operation, you move it for, an, for another operation, then you move it for painting, which is another operation, then you basically Unload it. Uh, usually painting is done with hangers. You hang things and move it inside the paint, of, uh, paint shop where everything is automatically sprayed. And then so you have to take it out from the hook. You, you hang things and move it with a conveyor and then everything is painted comes back. So very detailed but doesn't matter. So we unload it. Then we put it in a store. Then we unload it, we, we take it out of store when we are going to send it to the customer or whoever is going to take it there. So you take it out and you pack it and give it to the truck. Now, why is this important? This is another way of seeing the same thing, actually. But now you do it on the so-called layout. This is my factory. This is the layout of my factory. I have store here, this operation takes place here, this operation takes place here, and so on. And I need to see the movement of parts in my own layout. Now, if you look at this and you figure out that you don't do anything here, what if I move the receiving to this part, then probably everything that I am going to move in the factory will be moving less. Okay. So those are the things that we make use of it. But this is basically like a traffic map. You want to visit a number of places in a given city. You know that you are going to visit. So this shows the route that you are going to follow. But here we have a decision that we can make, a number of decisions. We can change the location of these shops. And by changing them, we can improve certain performance measures. OK, that's called. That will be something that you're going to see in production planning, 375. Well, not in production planning, in some uh, elective courses. That's called layout planning. But you're going to definitely do it in the project. 